Would you please welcome from Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk. Yes. Well deserved. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to wait to get a thumbs up from Stuart over here. We're ready to go. Well, we just went through a conversation with Dr. James Lindsay a few minutes ago about the theology of Marxism. And where, do you want to kind of sum up what you had just said, and then I want to transition from that into a conversation with Charlie, because Charlie serves at the front lines of everything that's happening. In many ways, I've been behind the scenes for a number of years. James, of course, is front lines, but boy, Charlie takes most of the arrows. So, but Dr. Lindsay, could you just explain to us again what you just spoke about? Yeah, so we got another two hours. Um, <laughs> It'll be easier this time. No, it's really simple. There are two major components, or three, I guess. Marx wants to throw down religion as a mystification. And in, re in place of that, he's going to take Rousseau's leftism, the idea of a social contract governing society in an increasingly socialist way, where we, use an, uh, we, we willingly give up our freedoms to achieve more freedom in the name of the greater good. And then he's going to tuck that into the Hegelian dialectic as a process to transform society into its ideal state. And so man is the creative subject in this religion who doesn't realize that he is his own God yet, but can realize that through this process by understanding the nature of his suffering rather than masking it with the opium of religion. And in the long march of history can actually realize his true nature, which is transcendent of private property totally communistic, perfectly social, and social man lives in social society with no difference between man and society any longer, and thus everybody pays Marx's bills. And the way that we get there is that the conscious within this, the woke within this religion, the born again within this religion, however you want to phrase it, sees the means of production of man, society, and the world, and transform it into a more human form, a form more usable by man, a form more suitable to man, which is essentially the Garden of Eden remade by men for men on earth uh, as it isn't in heaven. Charlie, how do you see that manifesting itself right now, not just within the political realm, but as well with the other cultural realms that you are dealing with right now on a daily basis? Yeah, first, honor to be here. Love sovereign nations, and I've known James for years. It's funny. Actually, two really, really important years, the last two years. I blew both these guys off years ago because they came up to me at some event. And I was like, I don't know what you're trying to do. But sovereign what? Like, I don't understand. Um, that was a mistake. And you learn as you get older. And when I first heard James talk on my podcast, I was just blown away. I was like, this guy's saying something really special. And he's done more good work in the critical race theory debunking world and has not really received the credit he deserves for that. And so I just want to let you know, James, you've done a great contribution to our country. I mean that, truly. So I love the, I love the title, The Theology of Marxism. The reason I like it is that sometimes we are led to believe that our opposition does not have core beliefs. And that's a mistake. And it's easy to come to that conclusion because we kind of summarize like, oh, they only want power. They want motorcades. They want people to go fetch their Diet Cokes. They want to go to wine parties. That's somewhat true for some of the people in the ruling class in our country, but it's not true for all of them. The most dangerous people that are running our entire civilization are the ideologues. They have thought this through and they have an answer for the chaos. And that's really disturbing. In fact, that should make you take pause. I would rather have the super corrupt person that doesn't really think it through and they just want to be senator this or congressman that. It's the person that actually thinks they're going to usher in an equivalent of heaven on earth through the destruction, through the dialectic, through the destruction of the American currency, through the opening of borders, through the elimination of gender norms. They think through all of that tension of the thesis and the antithesis that they're actually going to get to something that will be meaningful and better. And this was illuminated for me in amazing detail recently where I went on Tim Pool's program, who's kind of a Joe Rogan type, and I was debating a legitimate Marxist, a communist, and we started talking about Hegel. And he stopped me because I said, How do, what do you believe about this stuff? He said, Charlie, you're trying to tell me you don't think things are getting better? <laughs> and they actually believe through the chaos, through the disruption, through the destruction, that transition 
will then lead towards some sort of inevitable perfection. Now, this is so pathologically insane for those of us that live in the real world, that are Christians, that are raising children, that are married. We just kind of look at this abstract ideology in the clouds and be like, yeah, go back to whatever weird you know, feminist studies department it came from. The problem is that this is running our corporations, it's running our military, it's running the top levels of our government, it's running our curriculum, and it's now being run at not just an American level, but a global level. And I've kind of spent a lot of time uh, the last couple months, some of you probably seen the campaign we've been running the last couple weeks, all around trying to get Americans educated on what the Great Reset is. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this, and it is pure Hegelianism. It, it, it is the theology of Marxism, where Again, I don't know why they always pick Germans to run their one world government plan. Like, like, were all the French unavailable? It's like, it's just right out of a James Bond film. Like, just, you hear him talk, like, I, I inherently don't trust you, I'm sorry. Like, you could be saying that everyone should convert to Christianity, I'd still not trust you, honestly. Like, the way, you, like, you must understand the great reset. It's like, no, actually, I'm not buying it. Like, it's really weird and creepy. Um, and so, Anyway, we could talk about this. I don't want to monopolize the time, but I, the, the takeaway for all of you and my, my message to the grassroots, which is why this forum is so incredibly important, is do not underestimate your opposition. They actually believe in this stuff. They believe in the destruction because they think it will lead to something, quote unquote, better. They believe in the queer theory. It's not just power for power's sake. That is a simpleton man's argument to try to explain the chaos on television. It's not true. An ideologue is far more dangerous than a power-hungry politician. And as we just talked about in a session, a couple sessions ago, is that when you really look at what we would call the Great Reset, the Great Reset is a transition again. And so we had talked about it in regards to the French Revolution and Robespierre and the Jacobins, where they looked at it as a year one scenario. You would have Paul Pot looking at it as a year zero scenario and so forth. To reset everything, and start all over again in the right patterns. And Dr. Lindsay, just from what you have said in the past, and I know some things that you said on Joe Rogan's program a, a few months ago, really resonated with a number of people in regards to kind of explaining what the intent is of really creating that reset and moving into the next phase of humanity. And really it's what you were, I think, were just referring to in your previous session, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, so the model is ultimately what, what Karl Marx is talking about is that man is estranged from himself and estranged from nature. So what we have to do is we have to actually reset the world out of this unsustainable capitalist model, this shareholder capitalist model, where capital produces capital produces capital, which is an inherently, according to them, unsustainable system that's in fact an inherently illogical system that has to create weirder and weirder justifications for itself. But it, because it's an unsustainable system, as you know, maybe you could read some of the mid-century uh, previous century, 20th century, uh, Marxists would have written, you know, that, that, that it produces, what, so what capitalism does for them, and why it's not a sustainable system, is, well, sooner or later, all the basic needs are met. People have a pretty good standard of living. And so then what happens is, well, people still need jobs, so people create things that nobody needs it's just so that they can have more commodities to sell and to buy. And so what happens is that level happens. Everybody's Basic needs are met, and then you, lay, you make a layer of fake needs, and then the capitalist system fills that in, and then you make a layer of fake needs above that, and the capitalist system fills that in. And this just goes on infinitely, creating more and more and more and more in an infinite spiral that eventually crashes the whole system, collapses the ecosystem, destroys nature, in other words, where man is supposed to live and extract value and life from, destroys humanity itself by turning him into an increasingly commodity form. And so what you see, whether it's Karl Marx or that's me paraphrasing Herbert Marcuse uh, in the essay on liberation and uh, One Dimensional Man, his books from the 60s, uh, you see this kind of consistent theme. But what you see with Klaus Schwab is that there's been a problem, he says, in his newest book called The Great Narrative, yes. The Great Narrative 2022, to follow after The Great Reset. See, we'll have The Great Reset to reset the world, which the full title of that book is COVID-19, The Great Reset. Yep. Because COVID-19 turns out to be a unique opportunity, a narrow window of opportunity to shift the world to a new uh, state. But what's going to come on the other side is one where we're going to be more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. And what that actually works out to is that we have to take into account the natural world, the environment. But we also have to take into account things that um, 
corporations often don't pay attention to. You have environmental externalities, like they don't care to pollute, it's external to their, their balance sheet, so it's an externality, but they also don't really care about so-called human capital and what it actually means to live and be as a human. And Klaus Schwab actually says this in The Great Narrative, um, that the goal is to make nature and humanity so that it can be a sustainable, flourishing future, uh, because capitalism doesn't contain the logic necessary to accomplish this. But that's literally what Karl Marx wrote in the third manuscript of the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts that I was just quoting from in the previous lecture. Um, and we see the continuity through Herbert Marcuse, for example, very clearly if you read his works through the 1960s. So what we're seeing is that the Great Reset is to usher in a new paradigm that's based off of this exact same theology, this exact same idea that we can let the people who actually know how stuff's supposed to work and what the world's supposed to look like solve all of our problems for us, which are getting increasingly existential, increasingly out of control. Did you know we have synthetic biology now, he tells us, where you could create pandemics? Did you know that we have that? This could be so dangerous. He says things like this. Did you know that we're moving into a digital currency regime, he says, and that people could hack your currency, or they could even control and turn off your currency? Or you could have a digital ID that controls your buying and selling, or any of these things. Did you know that these are happening? He says that over and over again, how dangerous the world is. Better let us manage it for you, because they're the ones who know. And the goal is to make sure that we uplift humanity and uplift the environment so we have environmental and social goals at the heart of everything we're going to accomplish in our new sustainable environment that we're going to usher in so we are no longer caught in the contradictions of capitalism that will destroy humanity and our natural world that we live in. It's literally the same thing. And, you know, the thing that Charlie was just talking about a moment ago is that, you know, where James is talking about this from an economic structure level and in terms of the systems that we have that are coming in, that same thing which, that Charlie was just discussing earlier is that it's coming into then the rest of the pillars of our civilization. Right. It's coming into everything, and I think, uh, especially in, in regards to the people that are here in this room, it's coming into faith. And that's where, of course, I started off 10, 12 years ago trying to warn about these things. And so where you see it coming into faith, now Charlie has become very involved in things. He has an organization called Turning Point Faith now that has become much more active and so forth. That's really being able to, to kind of create that opportunity for a number of different folks that are of different denominational backgrounds, different, um, if you will, uh, confessional backgrounds and so forth. Uh, you know, there's no one particular doctrinal standard in terms of how you, what you believe about soteriology or pneumatology or anything else. But what they're seeing is here's a threat that's coming for all of us. But it's not just coming externally, it's coming internally as well. And so uh, just recently he, he interviewed a, a very good friend of mine that you know that I, I do a lot of things with, Tom Askell. Um, and it's important that we elect Tom Askell as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention to try to reverse some of the curse, as we would call it, a vampire-like parasitic thing that's actually a virus. A virus. a virus. A virus. Use their words. Yes, that's right. An Ebola-like virus that has infected us. But, Charlie, what have you seen to me? Because you've been dealing in the political world yeah. for so long, and now all of a sudden you've dipped your toe, more so than your toe, you've actually put two, two legs in, Holy into the pool of, the I've faith, taken the plunge. of faith. And yeah. so tell us how that's really how you've seen that now in the last year or so. Yeah, I just want to make one comment on the kind of virus analogy. I've said for a while, and the media hates when I say this, so I make sure I say it clearly and slowly, that the lab leak that has come from our college campuses has done and will do a lot more damage than a lab leak from Wuhan, China, right. which is the ideologies from our college campuses will do far more damage than COVID-19. And you're seeing it all around you. I'm not saying COVID-19 is not a threat, but we're destroying ourselves voluntarily because of wokeism, CRT, postmodernism, you know, deconstructionism. So I just wanted to add that. And I think a lot of you are here today because you have this daily frustration of like, my goodness, we're doing this to ourselves. Isn't that the great frustration right now? Like we are doing this to ourselves. It's not like we're being space invaded, right? It's a, it's a slow motion suicide, which makes people go insane. And it honestly should. You should, you should get angry over it over it because you're doing it to ourselves. So about the church thing, um, so yeah, look, I, I gave my life to the Lord in fifth grade at Christian Heritage Academy right side of, outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm sure someone knows that school, uh, founded by the great Wayne Grudem, who actually lives here in Phoenix now. And I'm now in Phoenix as well. Love it here. We've got to save it all together. My goodness, do we have our work cut out for us? But um, 
I was always told at a young age, growing up in a Bible-believing church, that kind of politics, philosophy, and culture are totally separate than the church. You wall it off, the church is for helping people, spreading the gospel, you know, it's kind of like rock concert with a TED talk, lots of skinny jeans, give the money, park the cars, like don't ask any questions, right? Like that's the church. And how naive we were when we thought that was actually what was supposed to happen, which is not theologically or biblically correct at all, while the bad guys were actually infiltrating our cemeteries, I mean our seminaries, <laughs> with this pathogen of wokeism. And the, the, the entry that they saw, the way that they were able to kind of get this ideology, this pathogen to attach successfully, is that bad theology leads to bad politics. And so they saw a great opportunity in the already beginning stages of deconstructionist theology. Maybe the Bible's not what it says it is, or that weirdo Andy Stanley in um, Atlanta who says, you know, Christianity is not about the Old Testament. It's about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's like, okay, yeah, then why did Jesus quote Deuteronomy? Like, can you answer me that? I mean, this idea that it's either inerrant, the word of God, or it's not. And that is the binary. You have to exist in that binary. And the kind of deconstructionist ideology started to seep in. So I was naive, 20, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. We shouldn't get involved in this at all. I then met my now pastor, Rob McCoy, who's phenomenal, Calvary Chapel, Thousand Oaks, where he just blew my mind and he challenged me. He said, Charlie, what you're doing on the campuses at Turning Point USA is exactly what is needed in the churches. That's right. And I had never spoke at a church before. I thought, you know, I, I don't have a doctorate. I haven't been, you know, I haven't gone, I don't know, my MDiv or any of this. And he's like, just come speak at my church. I said, what, are you kidding me? So I went and spoke at his church. It went really well. And this was right before COVID, locked down the entire country. I spoke at over 100 churches in about a year and a half in every corner of the country, from Bangor, Maine, to Albuquerque, to the great Jack Hibbs Church. You name it, I've been there. And I learned a lot. And I learned that the American church was under attack from within, largely from youth pastors that were attaching themselves into the congregation and bringing this bad ideology. Nothing against youth pastors. It just so happens they're the ones that most recently graduated from these, you know, these seminaries or from these schools. And then I realized these pastors wanted to do something, many of them, but they had no idea how to fight CRT. They didn't know how to fight on the American history. They didn't know how to navigate the Floyd thing. They didn't understand any of it. And so we launched TPUSA Faith back in August of last year. We have over 32 full-time people on the ground. We're just here to help. We're here to help pastors and churches better be able to fight for liberty in broad-based type coalitions. We're doing some fun things this next week together that hopefully we'll be able to tell the story afterwards. We have a pastor summit coming up in August. We'll have over 350 pastors there from across the country. So we're just trying to help. We're just trying to play a role. But let me kind of go a step deeper and then we can um, kind of keep going, which is, I was amazed at how weak the church was when it came to things that mattered. I was under the assumption that when the church was going to get locked down, that they were going to fight back. And these are the same people that were giving these sermons, like, got to have your Daniel moments. Like you, and like next thing you're like, yeah, the government told us to shut down. We have to shut down for two years and wear a mask when we shower and like take nine booster shots or like whatever, right? The government tells us because Romans 13, like really? Okay. Do you even know what Romans 13 says? And let me just talk about Romans 13 for a second. Does everyone know what that is? Okay. Maybe or maybe not. Romans 13 submits all rules and authority because God puts them in authority. It's just so simple. You just ask a pastor, okay, who's the authority in America? Oh, the people are the sovereign. Then who submits to who? The mayor submits to us. The senator submits to us. The president submits to us. We don't submit to them. You'd, if every pastor gave that sermon when COVID began, we would be a much freer country. Anyway, this just drove me insane. And so I'll just end with one more philosophical point on this where I think the church missed a great opportunity, which is everything that James is talking and Sovereign Nations talks about is a is comes down to some very simple questions, right? Which is, do you think human beings are naturally good and predisposed towards good or naturally predisposed towards evil? Now, you could be a mixture of both, obviously, but we as Christians, it's not even, it, you, you cannot come to a different conclusion than original sin. You can't. You're reading something different if it's not original sin. That's really important. Because they, the Marxists, the Rousseauians, believe that we're naturally good in the state of nature and that it's the environment, and it's the country, and it's private property that then corrupts us. 
But if you believe that people are naturally not so good, you should be thankful and amazed we've been able to do anything decent at all. And it's a totally different approach. And the church has the easiest answer to this, and they should be the loudest on this. And on the most important question, what is human nature? The church has remained silent. So uh, my mission is to help the church and pastors wherever we can, regardless of denomination, regardless. Of, you know, we had a pastor's roundtable the other day. We had a Baptist, a Pentecostal. You know, we had an Episcopalian. Don't ask me what they were doing there. A Lutheran, you know, <laughs> love the Episcopalians, but they're a little wacky on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And they're all arguing on theology. I just had to, I had to, okay, listen. They're like, pre-trib, post-trib. Like, I'm pan-trib. Okay, it's all going to pan out at, at the end. Okay? I said, if you guys keep this up, we're all going to be arguing our theological differences from prison. Like, cut it out. Let's fight for liberty to set the captives free. That's right. Let me just uh, hop on real quick yeah. here and point out that my friend Charlie is a busy man. And so when he just said what he just said, the, the really deeper point before that part that was really hilarious. Um, he didn't hear what we said all day today. Right. That's right. You're hearing it from another. He heard about the last five minutes of what I had to say from the back. He didn't hear it, but he said the same thing Mike told you. He said the same thing I told you. It is actually the interpretation of what's going on in our society and the philosophy that's led us here. Or I should say the theology that's led us here. Right. And so when you think about what happened three years ago when... I got up on top of that New York City rooftop. How many of you have seen that, that video with me and James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian? So three years ago when we did that, and basically I knew I was taking a huge gamble, but I had to do it because this is really the issue. So you have these two guys that come from the New Atheist Movement previously that had the exact same thing that deconstructed that movement happening within the Southern Baptist Convention. So we're talking about Resolution 9, we're talking about critical race theory and intersectionality. And so they had the exact same experiences. It's almost as if you get this social justice for dummies box. And it's every <laughs> single organization, you know, every single corporation, every single educational model, everybody gets it. Ravelry, the knitting group worldwide is doing the same thing. And so when you realize that it's happening at the same time, using the same techniques and strategies, and really trying to completely deconstruct everything. So now you know what this is. We're really all in this together. And so if we are, there has to be a response from people that are saying, we understand what the fight is right now. Now that doesn't mean, and I mean this in the Francis Schaeffer sense, this doesn't mean that you need to give up your confessions or give up the things that you believe in. Far be it from that. We can have those arguments, and we can have those arguments later. But right now, we really have an insurrection as well as an outside attack happening at the same time. It's shock and awe ideologically in a fifth generational war warfare sense. So you have Charlie, who's involved all with all these things. And I do want to confess something to Charlie. I think some of you know this. I've told you before. It was about 10, 12 years ago at a CPAC. Somebody introduced me to Charlie to see whether or not I would help to manage this young man. So you blew me off. I blew him off. See? James knows that. <laughs> I blew him off, I, and I was like, yeah, yeah. So last so, time was like retribution. <laughs> Apparently, I'm the victim here, because I just got caught in the crossfire. <laughs> so they got this feud, and here I am getting blown <laughs> no, off by... There's no feud. I just, it's like, what am I doing? Was it an 18, 19-year-old kid? Whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's got a lot of potential. Thanks a lot. Um, but, you yeah, know. you teamed up with an atheist and said, nice work. You talk about the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Anyway... <laughs> But then the Lord brought James Lindsay into my life, so that's good. Amen. But uh, so I, I think the thing that you realize is those of us that believe in the Lord, I believe that there's a lot of providence at work. And the thing is, is that, as I said to some of these folks that are with Charlie in, in the back room over here, is that the sands in the hourglass are few right now. And we have to think about how we need to fight these things. So, in essence, a lot of people want, and I believe that this is, I want to bring this up first before we jump into ESG. What I see, and you just tell me what you think about this, is that one of the greatest threats that we face right now is a lot like what's facing the Republican Party. It's basically the same model, is where you have the old Hegelians and the young Hegelians. Young Hegelians being the radical Democrats, old Hegelians being the rhino Republicans. But what you have now, in the last year and a half, is you have a lot of guys that are now talking about critical race theory and intersectionality, and it's very bad, but are unwilling to look at the guys that brought this in 
that are now trying to make sure that they slide past everything using the Mott and Bailey to be able to stay in leadership and continue on like a Mitch McConnell, like an Adam Kinzinger. You know, you can name whatever name Salazar in Miami. It's the same thing basically happening right now in the evangelical leadership world as well as the leaders of seminaries that brought this ideological cancer into the body of Christ and allowed it to be infected like this are now trying to let it go and trying to say, oh, well, we're all brothers now. Let's keep on moving. Nothing's happening here. Nothing to see. You know, again, these are not the droids you're looking for. And they're trying to move past this at a rapid pace. What would you say would, would be the things that we need to do to address this from your, both of your perspectives? So I'll go first. Is yeah, that okay? Go ahead, yeah. Please. Well, a couple things. I think you, you bring up some phenomenal points. Let me kind of just make sure we all know what time it is. So that I, I judge a politician based on how they tell the time, not obviously that metaphorically. What time is it? Do you really still think we live in a country where live and let live is a thing? And this is what drives me nuts about some older conservatives where they say, Charlie, why do you talk about the trans thing so much? I said, well, you still think we live in 1996. So you still think we live in a country where it's all about tolerance. So here's the spectrum, right? First, you must tolerate something, mandatory tolerance. Okay, fine, sure, I tolerate it. Then it's mandatory acceptance. You must agree with it. But then it's mandatory celebration. Right. Like you must then, no, no, then it's mandatory participation. Correct. What time is it? We are now transitioning from mandatory celebration to mandatory participation. Where that if you're a baseball player and you don't want to wear the patch right. on the sleeve in the Tampa Bay Rays, you're not allowed to play in the baseball game. Right. Mandatory celebration, mandatory par participation. So what time is it exactly? And we've done a lot of podcasts on this, and this is why I, I can't stand neoliberalism at its core in the Republican Party. I think liberals can be very nice people, but they're so weak and naive. I used to be one, honestly. I was. Not a liberal as you might think, but like a neoliberal libertarian that we can all kind of live and let live, and I won't interfere with your life, and you won't interfere with mine. What a lie! Are you kidding me? They put guns on our head. We're like, oh, actually, I'm going to let you do whatever you want. Actually, they're the ones that are willing to use force against us all the time. And we're supposed to believe that we're still in kind of this live and let live atmosphere. Look, live and let live works if both sides agree to it. It has to be a mutual detente. Right. They crossed that a long time ago. They realized the power of the state, the power of force, while most Republicans and conservatives live in this kind of fake kind of, um, let's just say, paradigm that might have existed 40 or 50 years ago, but I even doubt that. But that let's just pretend that it used to exist. So what time is it? That's the question I always ask our leaders. And if they think it's time to like marginally cut corporate taxes or maybe like, I don't know, restructure the import, export import bank, I'm like, you're a waste of time, okay? Instead, I wanna hear from our leaders very clearly that the country is slipping out of our grasp because of our own making that there is a multi-dimensional game being played against us of the elites crushing normal working people and that we need to invigorate regular people to be aware and active against what is being done to them. Mm -hmm. That's what time it is. And it has to be a conservative movement or whatever you want to call it, right, that is willing to make sure that the, these dividing lines are clear and that they will be held accountable for. So I'm a little bit, I'm optimistic in one sense, and I'd love James's opinion, because you mentioned the political side of it, which is we're in what I believe is the final phase. Here's the optimistic take. I just did a whole podcast on this, okay? Which is the final phase, in my personal opinion, is that you don't really care if you're called a racist anymore. Mm -hmm. That's, right. That's a big deal, because I used to care. Mm -hmm. It used to dominate my life. Mm -hmm. I used to choose my words differently because someone might call me the R world, R world. Our word. Before that, I say that 10 times, our word, our word, our word. Say that 10 times, 10 times. Before that, and it kind of happened Obama, right? Where all of a sudden people started to wake up, Dinesh D'Souza, all these people were trying to warn us that there was a Marxist infiltration of America. As soon as we started to recognize their multi-generational game, they started to weaponize name calling and it worked. They got a decade of plundering because we were in a mass paralysis over decency that never actually existed. So now we're entering the final phase where thanks to Donald Trump and thanks to a new generation of leaders and many other people that Tucker Carlson especially deserves a lot of credit for this, yeah. a lot of credit. And honestly, Rush Limbaugh tried to warn us about this for 40 years. We just listened to Rush in 1995, things the country would be a lot freer. 
where it's like, don't care what they say and all this. But here's the, the point that I want to make forward is the point we are right now, you don't care. They're starting to recognize that you don't care. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to realize their spell that they have over you is fading. Right. So there's only one thing they have left, force. That's right. Show trials, prison, literally. Peter Navarro being arrested, right. Steve Bannon being put on trial. That's all they have left. So we must endure this final phase, expose them using pure force, and you better believe we must be willing to use it twice as hard back at them. And that's a hard thing for conservatives to tolerate, which is like, actually, no, you're not going to do drag queen story hour or bars for kids. We're going to arrest you. We're going to put you in prison publicly and perp walk you if you do drag queen stuff for children. Like, we should be unafraid to say that. Like, we're not going to put up with it. And so, but the, here, here we are right around the corner from victory, everybody. Because you're here on a Friday where you could be doing anything else and you want to learn about Marxism, postmodernism. I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, that's not normal. They're not doing that. They're growing weak. They're growing apathetic. You are growing strong and you're growing wiser. You are part of a winning movement, but I just want to you know, you know what time it is. The time right now is they're going to use force against us big time. It's going to get messy in the next six to 18 months. We break through that, we're gonna have these people on defense, and I believe we'll finally be able to push a button to politically put them into an, a, an extinction level event, the likes of which we never would have dreamed of a couple years ago. James, did you wanna? So I agree with Charlie, um, and by the way, there's more proof of my claim. Charlie wasn't listening in secretly to repeat things that we had said, because he know, if he was, he would know that you're all here for the air conditioning, because it's hot outside. <laughs> It's cool in here. It's nice. I even got a jacket. I went outside for like one minute. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> we know why we're actually here on a Friday. You can't be doing anything else. It's 115 degrees out there. <laughs> he didn't know that we had that conversation earlier. I did. So I told you, he didn't know. But I actually agree. I will give you a little tiny piece of evidence I saw this morning about this claim that their, their spell is broken. They do cast spells. They're alchemists. They're magicians. They've casted linguistic spells on us. They've casted spells of fear and hysteria on us. And they're breaking. So here's one. I saw this article push on you know, Twitter or something this morning when I got up. And it says that something blah, blah, blah. You mentioned the transgender stuff. That we have to do this blah, blah, blah because experts say. They can't just say we have to do this because it's the right thing to do anymore. They don't have to appeal to the experts that nobody believes. They're realizing that they can't just morally browbeat us into this because the moral argument tipped the other way. And for whatever reason, this wonderful Pride Month, they decided that pedal to the metal, probably decided this six months ago when they also came up with Ultra MAGA, that putting that pedal to the metal would be a great idea this, this month, and it's backfiring on them spectacularly. There are drag queens everywhere. There's drag queen pastors. There's drag queens in the military. There's drag queens in churches. There's drag queens in schools. There's drag queens in public libraries. They're dragging kids out to 21 and up bars to go to drag queen shows. There's this whole thing happening now where it's adults aren't allowed to the drag. I just saw this. Libs of TikTok sent it to me earlier today. Literally, when I was at lunch, I saw it. You're not allowed to get into the drag queen show without, the adult isn't, without a child. They're pushing it so hard, they're screwing up. So I share Charlie's optimism. I also share Charlie's optimism for the reasons that uh, we've kind of been floating around all through the morning, which wasn't exactly the question. But the optimism is that where Mike was talking about the Reformation this morning and how that brought in a new era of knowledge and light. I actually don't believe that we entered into a marketplace of ideas. I believe that we think that we did or we were lied to and told that we were. But we actually entered into a feudal estate aristocracy of ideas where we have to listen to the experts who are trying to convince us that there's sudden adult death syndrome now and they're trying to convince us that the experts say that trans is necessary to take the kids to the drag queen shows. The experts are frauds and they know they're getting exposed as frauds and we are entering into the information economy that's a marketplace of ideas where it's going to show up their fraud over and over again. And in fact, I think they're hastening the way they are now because they know that their grip is about to slip. And if they don't get total control now, within maybe the next few years, they're going to lose everything. Because mm -hmm. you're going to be able to do your own research. I mean, we all know about the public health crisis we're not allowed to mention on the YouTube.com. And we all know that the internet figured out most of the story within about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Here we are two years later, and they're still trying to tell us about sudden adult, adult death syndrome. Right. We all see through it now, and that's rapidly gaining 
in momentum. So I share Charlie's optimism. I do think we are, sorry for this lame-o thing, at a turning point in, in, in history. I've been waiting the whole speech for that. You can uh, pay me later. There you go. I heard he's good. So, but to answer the question, what do we do? I get asked something all the time, James, do you think that these people really know what they're doing, that are implementing this stuff, that are bringing it into the door? Do, do you think they just maybe made a mistake? Do you think that they're incompetent? Or do you think that they're evil? I don't care. Fire them. Yep. Oh, they're incompetent. Let's keep her as something in charge of the Federal Reserve. Janet Yellen? No. Oh, wow. We didn't know about the inflation. We just got hit with a bunch of shocks. We had no idea shocks were coming. There were shocks. It tricked. Okay. Great. Nice job. Next. What is the phrase? You fired. Right. If you're incompetent, you're gone. If you're evil, you're double gone. Right. It's really simple. You have to be able to comprehend this. These were not honest mistakes after a point. They became negligent mistakes after a point, mm -hmm. if they were mistakes at all. And then many of the people that were implementing these things knew exactly what they were doing, which means they were engaging in sedition and treason. Right. Exactly. Those people have to be held to account. That's right. The people who have allowed this to happen have to be held to account. Courts can adjudicate whether it was intentional or unintentional via the processes that we use to make those judgments, and judges can make those adjudications and give the sentences that are fitting. We should preserve that. But this accountability is 100% and absolutely necessary. The people who were, a, were, were bringing this in, whether through negligence, yes. which maybe it started as honest mistakes, but it became negligence, and it became greed. It became somebody gave them a check for their ministry or gave them a check for a grant for their project. And then they were like, wow, we hired all these people. We built this cool new building. And now we've got this mortgage. And it's like, you want another check? We're going to make some changes. Well, you, guess what? In that instant, you became complicit. Mm -hmm. When you didn't say no, you became complicit. And accountability is necessary. So for these people, the attempt to skate by this, I get it. But no, accountability is the way we write the ship. That's right. The ship has listed because these people have pulled it so hard to the left, and we have to throw them off and bring the ship back up. The accountability is necessary, so they don't get to skate by this. Now, you talk about the brought in the CRT, brought in this cancer, brought in the, and the, they're going to just try to glide by it. Oh, man, since we're going to just transition, I know where we want to go. Wait until you hear about the people who weren't really responsible for implementing ESG. We were just doing corporate best practices. We had no idea. Right. Absolutely no idea. ESG is going to be the biggest accountability hole. Everybody's going to pretend they never did it. The rats are jumping ship on that already. So I'm telling you, accountability is the key. Well, sorry that we were talking while you were saying, because here's the thing. I was talking to them. <laughs> so I talk to you all the time. Remember we, we, we were talking about earlier, and this is why I said through the day, hey, we're going to hold off talking anymore about this. But here's the, let's, let's go ahead and pull up the hood over what's happening with this entire move into the fourth industrial revolution, which is really more spiraling into the dialectic. Um, and when you take a look at what's really powering all of the changes that we just discussed in economics and education, in corporate uh, areas as well as within faith, at the center of this, and this is what I kind of blew up this week on Twitter in regards to Guideposts, the organization coming out with the SATF on the, the Southern Baptist Convention, was that they are ESG driven. The organization that they brought in to do their entire report in the Southern Baptist Convention is driven by DEI and ESG. Yes. But ESG is the thing that's actually behind everything that we see moving right now, environmental, social, and governance. Right. So when we talk about ESG, you're talking about the religion of environmentalism. You're talking about an enviro, enviro communist socialist fascist move that's happening right now that is a, a hybrid synthesis of the worst of all ideas, a gain of function of the worst ideas mm -hmm. of mankind. So when you look at ESG and you see how that's driving everything, and I know you've spent a lot of time trying to convince folks like Dr. Jordan Peterson a long time ago about how this was happening and so forth. How is ESG driving nearly everything in this entire move, and why is it something that we need to focus on? I know it sounds obscure to some of you folks, but why is that so important? 
can I, can I? Yeah. So l let me just say a couple things on this. The corporate topic is something I'm really passionate about, which is kind of involving in all of this. The only thing I hate more than wokeness is weakness. It drives me yeah. crazy. Like, it's okay, fine. The wokies are always going to be around there. They're only powerful because of weak people. Okay, they're only powerful because people in power that didn't have courage allowed them to take root. And if there was one community of people that I think is most responsible for where we are, it would be people that knew better and did nothing. Yeah. Also known as our Fortune 100 CEOs. I mean, these people are despicable. I don't say that lightly. Is that they all went to the best schools and they get held hostage the same way James just articulated it by their $26 million a year salary, by their kid wanting to go to the same school they went to, and they are held hostage by the wokey insurrectionists that come from the HR boardrooms and say, okay, here's what you're gonna do, Coca-Cola. You're gonna have a whiteness is evil PowerPoint presentation. You're gonna have Robin D'Angelo come in. But it's, it's even worse than that, though, because ESG is actually structural. It's about financing. It's about we're not going to partner with your company if you do not have a proper ESG score. And this really does kind of come from the top. And I love markets. You guys love markets. But we should also be honest that markets should serve people, and we do not serve markets. It's a big difference. We are a country that has an economy in it. We are not an economy that has a country in it. This is what makes us conservatives, not libertarians. So when I see a company that has $10 trillion in assets run by Larry Fink, and they're going and buying single family homes, and they're gonna start rating who can rent the homes from them based on their social score as a citizen. I'm like, that's not, I don't, I don't you could call that capitalism, that's disgusting, it's wrong, we shouldn't put up with it. And so some people in the Republican Party say, Charlie, you know, that's not very puritanically market driven. Of course it's not, obviously, because I don't like tyranny and you don't either, and I don't like the tyranny of government, and I certainly don't like the tyranny of, tyranny of BlackRock. And so what you have is these massive funds that, by the way, are heavily subsidized by cheap money policies, bailouts, $6 trillion bills that never should have been passed by the federal government. They got richer while you struggled. They benefit from inflation, make no mistake. Inflation is a gift to the ruling class. They can move their assets quickly. They can raise rates. They can raise apartments, rent. They could do all these things. Inflation will crush you. They'll get richer from it. And then they're able to change the rules of who gets to play in the sandbox. And just one example on ESG, and then I'll let James riff on it, it just shows the utter fraud. What company has just recently got a bad ESG score? Elon Musk's Tesla. The, the electric car company can't get a good environmental score. Why? It's because Elon's a threat to the regime. Because Elon would sit through this forum and agree with 99% of what we were just saying. And Elon is willing to go buy companies, start new things, and be courageous. So they must penalize him for that. Mm -hmm. So, James, what's the significance of getting a bad ESG score? Well, well hey, man, can, can I go into something real quick? I want to yeah, ask do you it. a question first. Charlie, where, where does BlackRock and Larry Fink, where have they put about $7 trillion worth of their assets? Where have they decided to go ahead and keep those assets? Do you know? I don't. I mean, I know they've been doing farmland and a lot of single-family homes, but you've got to well, tell me. Well, in, in terms of their, their liquid assets, they've put a lot of them in China. That's right. You're right. So all of a sudden, this, the grand majority of what they have is being put over in Chinese banks. Well, who is it that's going to absolutely ignore ESG? China. <laughs> you know, so while they're building nuclear power plants, we're dismantling them. While we are dismantling coal-fired uh, coal plants and so forth, they're building them. So that's something. So I'm sorry. James Riff. Riff on ESG. I mean, so, I mean, I think Elon Musk is the one who said that he thinks ESG is the devil incarnate yes. on Twitter a couple of months ago. Um, it's certainly a scam. I've described it, if you want to control the bull on Wall Street, the way you control a bull is put a ring through its nose and jerk it around. ESG is that ring. It turns out that Charlie left out a very important piece of why it should really irritate you. Because Larry Fink isn't screwing around with markets and gaining control over them with his ESG scores, which, by the way, if it was really like people haggling out what does sound environmental policy look like, what does sound social responsibility for corporations look like, what does sound corporate governance look like, and they're haggling it out, and there are different answers to this question, and they were debating it, and so on, 
ESG, whether or not it serves the interests of long-term profitability, which is the justification they give, that's an open question that would be worth answering. But it's not. Larry Fink gets to decide what's environmentally sound. Larry Fink gets to decide, or whoever's uh, working with Larry Fink and some kind of a, I don't know, what's this, what was the Russian word for council again? Soviet. That's right. <laughs> They get to decide what's environmentally sound, socially sound, et cetera. So all of a sudden they can tank Tesla on their ESG yep. score because Elon Musk said, well, I made, Twitter seems whack. Maybe I'll buy it. And they're like, wow, Tesla has a terrible social score now. It's yep. terrible. Elon has terrible social skills. He's autistic. They even said that. Yep, that's right. So it's, it, that's ableism by their own standards. And they, they don't care because their standards don't apply to them. Hey, what was the other thing that, that uh, Elon Musk actually said that probably set them off in regards to ESG? Uh, that it's a scam? I don't Correct. Know. Yeah. The, the ExxonMobil thing was the most interesting one, where he said, why is it ExxonMobil has a good environmental score and Tesla doesn't? Right. And like, look, we, we love fossil fuels, but if he's right, I mean, obvious, yes. it's because ExxonMobil bends the knee. ExxonMobil will worship Molech, yep. and Tesla will not. Yeah, so the question then, the thing that Charlie didn't touch on is, where in the heck did Larry Fink get all this power? Well, Larry Fink runs a uh, index fund management, which is passive investment, which means your retirement, your pension funds. He's taking trillions of dollars of everyday people's retirements and leveraging that against the entire market so that it falls under his control and his definitions. So the way that it works is that if you don't meet the definitions of BlackRock, Vanguard, whoever all is in the cabal of the, what is it, the council, the Soviet, of controlling that, deciding what these words mean, the World Economic Forum's right in their hand and glove. If you don't meet the council's, the Soviet, uh, definitions of environmental, social, and governance, they're going to leverage your retirements against companies that don't play ball. Coca-Cola doesn't want to play. Well, maybe Coca-Cola isn't going to get so much investment capital anymore. But you think Coca-Cola is huge. It doesn't need investment capital. It just has to stop alienating customers and selling loads and loads of Coke because Coke is great and totally American thing. But that's okay because BlackRock and Vanguard and these companies that are in the cabal or the, the council, the Soviet, own something like 30% of Coca-Cola. So they're like, Coca-Cola, play ball, or we'll sell all the shares, and your stock price is going right in the toilet. And if you spiral down and crash into the mountain, so be it. Good luck, because we're not giving you anything to help you. This is what's called extortion or That's racketeering. Right. That's right. This is a racketeering scam run by a cartel. But if you say these words, people get real scared. That's how this is at. You want to riff. This is a cartel running a racketeering scam yep. based off of cooked books, environmental, social governance policies that can change like that. You know, we have this all of a sudden conflict spring up in the breadbasket of Eastern Europe, as we'll refer to it. It has a blue and a yellow flag. You maybe have seen it. it. It's the signal, symbol on social media that somebody's going to say something really dumb if it's on their social media profile. That's how they tell you they're going to say something completely wrong, is that they have that on their, their handle, on the Twitter. Okay, so anyway, that place has a conflict arise in it, and so immediately the social score... The S score in ESG for weapons manufacturing for that in particular goes up. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, like, uh, Northrop yeah, Northrop Grumming and all of all, Raytheon. Halliburton, uh, Raytheon, all these huge weapons manufacturers are ESG compliant because they build a more socially good world because it serves the social goals of the people who have a particular invested outcome in the conflict that arose in said breadbasket. That's a fraud. That's fake. That's totally fake. There are something like, what was it I saw? 160 billion masks floating in the ocean because of said public health crisis. We're not allowed to say anything about the coof. 160 billion masks. Remember how we have to drink out of stupid paper straws that suck and ruin your drink because the plastic straws go and anger a turtle or something in the ocean? Which turns out that the science showed that they don't actually do that, but it doesn't matter. We still have to have paper straws in plastic wrappers because they're ESG compliant. All of the mask requirements that led to 160 billion masks floating in the oceans that actually do strangle sea life raised your environmental score because they dealt with a public health environmental crisis. It's totally arbitrary power masquerading as doing the right thing, according to the Council for Public Safety that's headquartered in, in Davos. It's a scam. It's a cartel. And what they do then is they, so they go through the, the fund managers, right? So they'll go to BlackRock, Blackstone, 
they'll go to the big ones and they'll get them to sign an ESG pledge. So they'll get the HR Wokies to pressure them. Okay, sure, I'll only trade with ESG approved companies. So then what they've done is they've created ESG ETFs and th then they'll only be allowed to trade within the companies on the ETF. So the significance of Tesla not being on the ETF, they'll be fine because you guys will still buy Tesla stock because it's actually a great company and he's done an amazing job. But for a company that's a little bit on the edge, like 3M or whatever, if they don't get a good ESG score, then that could be the end of their company. Because the big funds, not the, not the retail people that you know, buy $50 a stock, the people that could park $50 billion, Fidelity, Schwab, Goldman Sachs, they've all signed these ESG, ESG pledges. And by their own pledge, they're not allowed to then go trade if it doesn't have a certain ESG score. So that's a way how they've been able to hold all of corporate America hostage. It's a massive hostage taking scenario. And they all, and, and the, the CEOs that have done this, you could just see the, you know, their excuses. Well, we had no idea, like James said. We didn't, we didn't know what, we, of course, you guys are so weak. All you care about is your second or third house in the Bahamas. You don't care about the country. You don't care about the nation. You don't care about your children. All you care about is that $26 million bonus. And I mean, Jesus was right. It's the love of money, not money itself. That is the root of all evil. And these corporate hacks, man, I'll tell you what, they have to, they, the reckoning has to come against them because they knew better. They were tasked to actually be guardians of our country. And one final thing I'll say with this is that if you go to any sort of you know, history class, uh, by the way, we just launched uh, Turning Point Academy here in the Valley, uh, oh, cool. which is very exciting. Very we're partnering with uh, Dream City Christian Enrollments Open. So if you're sick of your kid's school, come to our school. They'll learn real history and real civics, um, vetted curriculum and trained teachers. It's going to be awesome. So. If you want more information on that, happy to give it to you guys. But if you go to any other history course, they'll vilify Carnegie, Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan Chase. A lot of that is misconstrued. Some of it's true. But I'll say one thing about the titans that they called in the Gilded Era. They never would have signed an ESG pledge. Those guys loved America. Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Chase, they loved America so much that they bailed out the U.S. government when it was necessary. They never would have signed an intercontinental agreement around some arbitrary ideology. They're like, no, 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 we're rich and we love the country that got us rich. Something happened, and I think you know why from this, where all of a sudden the rich people end up hating the country that made them rich. Now let's talk about the S in ESG and really how this applies to average everyday Americans. Now you may be thinking that, well, you know, I'm not heavily invested in the market. What do I care about ESG? What is well, unfortunately, it then populates everything. It's not just a question of products. It's a question as well, financial institutions. But then, in regards to you personally, and what actually is articulated through DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, does that, and I already know the answer to this, but please, if you can, how does that end up actually become our credit score? And then those that are doing business with us or employing us have to start to consider what our scores are as opposed to just the corporations. Well, I want to start by telling you you're mispronouncing the S. It's not pronounced S in ESG. It's pronounced S. Like the hiss of a snake. <laughs> like the hiss of a snake. It's really weird what it is. Um, so I get asked a lot why it's impossible to get, say, a university, often to get a company, to get anybody to try to dismantle some of the DEI apparatus. You can't find a single university that Every university president knows. They know that they're going to have the biggest boom in enrollment that they've ever seen, ever, if they just kick out the woke stuff. They all know this, but not a single one of them will do it. And that means there's something much bigger holding them hostage in what it largely is. The DEI department is serving the S score for their ESG, which is running their entire organization's uh, Pension funds, it's in access to them. It's, it's running their organization's investment capital capacity. It might even work out to where it's running their ability to take, say, federal student loans at some point or some, all of these things. So they're beholden to this thing. So you can't get rid of the DEI department in a single university because it's about 80 to 85 percent of the S score in ESG. It's pronounced like the snake would say it, right? You get the, you get the reference. I read the reference actually earlier. Um, in my talk. Did you know I quoted Genesis in my talk? It's good for an agnostic. You used to call yourself an atheist. Progress, like Hegel would yeah, say. Progress. Right, everybody? Progress. Yeah. It's very progressive. I mean, 
the way you described conservative earlier, I'm like a conservative all the way too. So watch his jaw drop. There you go. <laughs> He's been waiting to hear that it's for been, like two years. I have. I said, James, I think you're more like us than it. my favorite quote ever from James was at a Turning Point USA event, America Fest. I know a lot of you guys came to that, and if not, you guys got to come in December. It's amazing, 10,000 plus people at the Phoenix Convention Center. And James, he said, you know, if there was a devil, he would have created queer theory. I was like, that's that's really a big statement for you know an agnostic. I was like, that's. I totally agree, like this stuff is demonic. Um, but I, I wanna just mention one other thing about the social credit system. We're already entering into that. This is gonna impact banking. It's gonna impact your own ability to get financing. Um, they are trying to create a reward and incentive and inversely a punishment system if you participate in wrong think. Uh, if, you per if you participate in the wrong thoughts or you vote for the wrong person, they do wanna be able to have a financial pressure against you. So I do wanna mention one, thing that we have to do in the f last five minutes that just kind of is a solution to this. You're like, wow, this is so overwhelming. It is, but I do believe that this is the, this is the importance of philosophy and ideas, which I know can make people you know, kind of bored at times, but you're all, pro you know, all, you're all very invigorated by all this, which is the more we're able to get our message out, all we have to do is flip a couple of these people. That's all we have to do, is that we don't have to win them all. We just need a couple more defectors like Elon. Look, they're gonna throw everything they can at Elon. I live in Scottsdale, every third car is a Tesla. Unless they you know, take Epstein, that guy, he's gonna be a force to be reckoned with. Meaning that they just red-pilled the guy worth $220 billion. And it, he's obviously game for impulsive transactions to try to save Western civilization. Awesome. And the point is that we don't have to win them all over. That's why people like James and Sovereign Nations and all of you are so important, is we just have to have a couple defectors and then we have to build our own stuff and then meet them in the middle. We have to build schools, we have to build churches, support the good churches, build families. You don't have, look, it seems overwhelming, but here's the thing, they're so incredibly weak, all these people. They're not ready for a fight, we are. These corporate hacks will run to the hills and the Wokies are running out of political and social capital. There's only so many New York Times front page op-eds on BLM, by large mansions, that they could possibly do. <laughs> No one believes it anymore. And so there, there is this realignment and you're living through the realignment and you could call it the fourth turning or whatever you wanna call it, which is a great book that was written a long time ago that I think articulates what we're living through. But their ideas are so bad, they're so dangerous. And I think for just even a somewhat rational person, Bill Maher, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, is that you're going to see, in my opinion, the great defection. And it's because we have to just do it every day. We got to what you call it, do the work, right? Yeah, yeah, do the work. You got to do the work. And that requires daily radio shows, daily podcasting, daily tweets. It feels as if it's just like monotonous, right? Like how long? You got to keep doing it. You have to continue to push forward. You got to keep on consuming the information because Elon's transformation from a non-political neutral observer could largely be attributed not to CNN, not to Fox News, not to Tucker, but a satire side of the name Babylon B. That's right. That a random satire site that he started to see, like, this is hilarious. Is this stuff, really, is this true or not? Per, the best satires when you can't find, you can't determine if it's true when you first read it. And they red-pilled the world's richest man. And so that's part of the hope that we have is that we just have to flip a couple of pieces on the chessboard. We do that, this whole thing gets realigned almost overnight. I'll give you some backup too, because what, what he's talking about, you know, you know, we, we, we get the schools, we get some schools, you get the things start going. Here's the way that this, S actually works. I want to give you, and then I'm going to say a word that you're not supposed to say from the stage except in a very negative light here in a second, so brace yourselves. But as it turns out, you can imagine how this ESG score goes from corporate management universe to you management universe very easily. So let's say that there's some bank, I don't know, like MasterCard, for example, or whatever, and you have a credit card with them and you have lending with them or you, you know, credit with them, et cetera. And right now you think, well, that, that's money. That's, I, who cares what I, my beliefs are or whatever. But eventually what can happen is MasterCard's ESG score goes down by serving you if you have the wrong politics. Right. So all of a sudden, MasterCard starts enforcing whether or not you can be a client of MasterCard if they'll process your payments. And Visa could jump on, and American Express could jump on, and Discover could jump on, and all of a sudden, you are stuck because yeah. nobody will process your payments. You can't buy things if they won't process the payment for you. 
And so they can bring this ESG score to you. Well, how do we know if MasterCard should keep you or not? Well, we'll give you a personal ESG score, and if your ESG score, aka social credit score, is good, the MasterCard will process your payments, and if it's not, then it'll pause them or freeze them or it won't. And so then it can bring a social credit score to you, which brings a complete control mechanism. Now, you've been warned, and here comes the word. Everybody brace yourself, gird your loins, as it were. That's a pun you don't know that's coming yet. The porn stars told you this was coming, and you didn't listen because you were not a porn star, so you did not speak out. They stopped processing porn stars' payments a number of years ago, MasterCard specifically did, because they didn't like what they were doing with their professional career. Now, think what you want of pornography. They deplatformed Al uh, Alex Jones, for example, oh, and President Trump. That was political. It's similar. It's, in fact, the same. I'm not defending porn or porn stars. I'm saying that there's a principle here that nobody stood up for, that a corporation could say, we don't like the way you behave, so we're going to deplatform your ability. We to won't bake your cake. We won't, yeah, exactly. We won't bake your cake. They I, I fully support not transacting porn stars. But. <laughs> I'm just saying that whatever you think of that particular <laughs> issue, whatever you no, think I of that don't. particular issue, it sets the stage and the justification for them to limit anybody for something right. on down the yeah. line, especially when you're in a movement that's based on, like we've already discussed, blurring out discernment. You don't know they get to decide what's good and bad. So you may agree, let's block out porn star transactions, maybe for porn specifically, maybe in general, I don't know, but it's somewhere down the line. If you put absolutely no limiting principles in there, it's you voted for the orange man, so therefore we're going to block yeah. out your transition. So we've seen this coming. Yep. They were warning about it. Whether you agree or not, the point is not about that. The point is a social credit system that controls your ability to buy and sell, which maybe you should read your book of Revelation, is, <laughs> I mean, I read it. Yep. I did. I bothered. Uh, I made a Klaus Schwab meme, V will control your buying and selling. I wasn't kidding. This social credit system can be moved to the personal, and the point is to control you. And I want to go deep. I know we're at the time, but I want to go deep because this was in the Marxist literature 65 years ago when Herbert Marcuse was writing the essay on liberation. He explained four chapters to that. Chapter one, a biological foundation for socialism explains why we need to change man at the biological level to make him suitable to socialism. Chapter two, a new sensibility. Chapter three, transitioning forces. Chapter four, solidarity. Those first two matter. The goal is to create a biological foundation for socialism, to change man, just like I just told you is the theology of Marxism, to accept socialism, to become social man who lives in social society. Chapter two is a new sensibility. How is it accomplished? Marcuse says, being a Marxist, that the social conditions make man. Society makes man. I didn't make this up. He says that. He says, in fact, that society interjects morals that make man's vital needs. They define for man vital needs. So if you were to interject other morals, force people to participate in other moral codes, say through an ESG social credit score, that if you behave wrong, then you're punished, through an algorithm that conditions what you're allowed to see, through deplatforming algorithms that take you away from your ability to communicate if you don't act the way, they can put a new moral system, a new morality, he says, a new rationality, he says, a new sensibility, he says, and introject it into the person until it changes him at a biological level to be made not just suitable for socialism, but to where he can't live without it. Right. That's the goal. That's what the social credit system at the end of the ESG rainbow is meant to accomplish, to condition you to the point where you can't function, so you buy into the system until you live the morals, the equity program in the E and the DEI and the S score, until they become so natural to you that they're spontaneous and you don't know any other way to live. Right. It's exactly the Marxist theology incarnate. That's what this is about, a system of total control to remake you for their sustainable, they put the sus in so, uh, sustainable, I say, <laughs> very sus. That's the kids. Ask your kids what sus means. Charlie knows. I know. I know. That's the goal. That's the objective, to remake you or to make you absolutely unable to participate in society and thus irrelevant until you expire on some minimal program 
that they allow you to have for justice until a new morality is established so that people can't live without it. Klaus Schwab says explicitly, when he's talking about ESG and Zikret narrative, he says explicitly that the government and the corporations will partner in a public-private partnership to enforce it yes. from the top down. And meanwhile, the young people will be raised to need it, and they will demand it from the bottom up. Did we not talk about top down, bottom up, inside out this morning? Of course we did. No BS. We're telling you what's going on in the world, why it's going on in the world, and how it's going on in the world. So how do you resist it? They want to introduce a new morality and interject it into you. Whatever tools, ESG, corrupted schools, et cetera, they're using to do it, you make alternatives to that. That's how. That's how. Yeah, Charlie, and, wrap it up and give us a charge. I, I, so a couple charges. Uh, all this seems overwhelming and intimidating. I, when you read The Great Reset, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. America, America will no longer be the world's superpower. Western values will be brought to a breaking point. There's some other goofier ones on there, but we could, everyone will be going to Mars and lots of refugees and all that stuff. But those are the three that we could focus on. Look, all of you, here's the cool thing. Here's the message of empowerment is today and tonight, many of you have to make a decision, some of you already have, is that I'm going to embrace self-government is that I am going to be able to sustain myself and my family regardless of what they do to me. Don't be taken by surprise. And yes, that goes from food, that goes from your ability to protect yourself physically, be able to transport yourself. You have to embrace self-government. You gotta get back to local communities, strong churches, strong families. Empower yourself, and that will make you a happier, more joyful warrior. I mean, for me personally, it's like, okay, we're already divested from MasterCard. For example, we don't use any of the big banks at Turning Point USA. We're smarter than that. Our COO got canceled by Bank of America for wrong think. It's, ha it's going to happen to all of you. Stop using the big banks. Go find the local ones. Go find a credit union where you can look at them in the eyes and keep your money there. They will take your money and freeze your accounts if they, if they, soon if that happens. If you run a business, you're especially at risk. They could, they could make it where you can't do payroll, freeze all your money because you made a contribution to Blake Masters for Senate or because you just supported Donald Trump or whatever. And so you have to embrace self-government in every form or fashion. That goes from the education of your children to the ideas that you consume to where you go to church to all these things are so incredibly important. And our founding fathers wrote extensively about that. And then I just want to reinforce a couple things, which is don't underestimate the power of philosophy and ideas. Learn something new every single day. And this is why I'm a big fan of Hillsdale. Please take their Hillsdale online courses. They're amazing. You guys can go to our partnership website. It's charlieforhillsdale.com. I'm on the radio three hours a day here in the Valley, 9 to 10 on AM 960, and then in the evening from 6 to 8 on AM 960. And we're always trying to teach you something because I've been taught so much by to you know, amaz these two amazing people on stage and people like them. I think informed grassroots citizens is the greatest weapon against the left. We do three podcasts a day. If you guys want to subscribe, it helps us out a lot. But beyond that, find things where you're learning and you're constantly being challenged. And you, have, you might disagree with what's being told, but at least you have a good argument and response. That will make you a sharper citizen against the regime. You could be a serf, you could be a slave, you could be a subject, or you could decide to be a citizen. And the final thing is that I'll say with this, a lot of you came here probably, and you're like, Charlie, I've done everything that's been asked of me. Okay, I watched Tucker Carlson, <laughs> I bought the pillow, like, <laughs> I have a closet full of relief factor, I reverse mortgaged my home, I have more gold than I know what to do with, I bought that weird chair that goes up the stairs, Charlie, what else can I do? There's only so many Trump coins I could give my friends. <laughs> and the answer is no longer be a spectator, but be a participant right. in this fight. Right. It's the man in the arena that counts. Build new stuff. And if you can't build new stuff, support the people that are building new stuff. And what do I mean by that? Businesses, nonprofits, churches, communities. There's the fighters and the people that help the fighters. Okay, you could be a Washington or you could be a Hancock. Hancock, despite his big signature, never wore the uniform of the Continental Army. He financed it though, he supported it, he was like a logistics manager, there were no supply chain issues back then, he knew what he was doing, but Washington was on the front line. Some of you are gonna be called to the front lines, run for office, run for school board, do all those things. Some of you, that's probably overly intimidating. It's not an excuse not to be involved. Pray for your leaders, find the warriors, pray for James, pray for sovereign nations. You pray for this work that's happening, and then you actively help them. What I'm getting at is it's gonna take all of us, and I could tell you right now, the people in charge, they are the angriest winners that I've ever seen. They're the most paranoid winners in the history of the planet. It's because they can start to feel the ground that they're standing on trembling, 
and it's trembling because the citizen is starting to rise to challenge their power and kick them out once and for all. And that's your marching order here for tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Charlie Kirk and James Lindsay.